Okay, good morning, everyone. We better get started. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get into the material for today. Um, just talking with the TAs, I understand that some people are having a little bit of confusion about where to do your analysis and to do your homework. You should be doing it on Malibu, not on your laptops. The environment in Malibu is set up to, to just work for the most part. If it's not working for you, reach out to the TAs and CC me and we'll try and figure it out. I'm having a little bit of issues with Malibu, but as far as I understand the homeworks work, I've done them myself on Malibu and it should work. Other thing, um, when you reach out to TAs, if you could CC or email all four of the TAs at once, that way everyone, each of them have an opportunity to try and respond to you because there's, there's a lot of people in the class, there's a lot of requests. Um, rather than just emailing to an, an individual TA, that would be great. Um, and I think TA hours are are um, still twice a week. Is that is that working for the most part? Along with emails and stuff like that, everything going okay? All right. Has anyone had still had issues with getting an account on Malibu? Is everyone good there? Okay, great. All right. So today, what we're going to talk about. Um, is what I think is fairly exciting is the, the way these DNA sequencing technologies that we use today work um, and some of the innovations that have occurred over the last uh, decade and a half. And then we're going to get into something that's a bit dry but essential, which is this FASTQ format, which is basically the data format in which DNA sequencing data from these technologies is stored. And that's basically the raw substrate for doing really any uh, biology. Uh, with these sequencing technologies. So a lecture or two ago, I talked about, briefly talked about this Sanger sequencing method, and I think all of you have learned this before. I just kind of want to recap it. Um, the basic idea, and this, this was the, uh, how Fred Sanger won his second Nobel Prize, um, was a, basically a trick, uh, an insight. So normally when DNA polymerase replicates DNA, it's incorporating um, deoxy um, nucleotides, right? So his idea was to terminate that reaction using dideoxy nucleotides. And so the, the innovation was to, in four separate rea reactions, one to um, sequence all strands that uh, terminate in A's, another reaction for termination in T at T nucleotides, C's and G's, you basically, in those four reactions, you're adding polymerase, template molecules that you're trying to sequence, the natural nucleotides that are not terminating the, the sequencing reaction, and at a very low concentration, the dideoxy nucleotides. So in each of those reactions, most of the template process polymerase incorporates the normal nucleotides, but every once in a while, because it's at low concentration, that, terminate, that, uh, that uh, sequencing reaction will stop for that molecule because a dideoxynucleotide has been incorporated. So you do that, and then you run um, each of the four different reactions on a different lane in a gel, and basically those, those fragments separate by the length of the nucleotides that was incorporated until that dideoxynucleotide was incorporated. And then what you end up doing, what uh, grad students ended up doing back in the day, was essentially reading the sequence by looking at the longest strand all the way down to the smallest strand. And, and lane by lane to figure out what the sequence of nucleotides would be. So this would be C, G, T, C, A, T, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Super clever, worked really well, just slow, low throughput. Yeah? <laughs> I've never done it, so I don't know. Uh, anyone ever done this? I think uh, in our day, for all of us, we probably all just like send it out to a company and get a sequence back. That's uh, I don't know. We have some film from the Steph one that looked like that that was done. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's good. I mean, I I, I would imagine uh, having done one PCR reaction in my entire life, um, that it's all about you know setting up everything properly and and doing it a few times and learning what works and what doesn't work. Um, I'll tell you another story about my limited molecular biology experience in a few minutes. Um, so Lee Hood um, probably should win a Nobel Prize for this. Um, 
or something equivalent to it. So basically what he realized is instead of incorporating just dideoxy nucleotides, let's add a fluorophore to those dideoxys so that you can actually then, instead of having a technician or a grad student squint over a gel that may or may not be that pretty, we could automate that by basically scanning the gel and reading off the sequence directly. So I think it's quite obvious, but you know, that's what the fluorescence would look like. And if a laser scanned across it, the intensity of the peak of fluorescence that's um, created by exciting the fluorophore with um, a laser would look like that. And then you get these you know, really nice, pretty um, traces, Sanger traces, as they're known. Um, so this was, and then the advance was this, that, that electrophoresis was done on a capillary, a really thin capillary so that a laser could just scan right along that long structured filament. Um, and that's why it's known as capillary Sanger sequencing. So um, this, this was state of the art basically until I, right around the time that I went to grad school. I started in grad school in 2004. And the first sequencing data set that I ever worked on was um, Sanger sequencing data from a few exons of a gene that my lab was interested in from a few hundred patients. And that data set had taken nearly a year to generate, it was super expensive. And what we were looking for was single nucleotide polymorphisms, as we talked in last, talked about last time, that segregated with phenotypes. So I spent basically the first year in, of my graduate career working on data like this, then all of a sudden these new technologies popped up and we sort of switched gears in the lab and, and invested in developing technologies to, um, computational technologies to study these, to leverage these new sequencing technologies to study genetic variation. So let's now transition into what those new technologies are. Um, so, you know, just recapping what um, sort of the innovation from 1977 all the way down to 1999, Sanger came up with that technique back in 77. And you know, one really hardworking technician or grad student could knock out about 700 bases a day. So to use that technology to sequence the human genome would take a long time, 118,000 years for one person. Um, and then with Lee Hood's innovations, we scaled up in 1999 to you know, about 400,000 bases per day using this uh, I think it was Applied Biosystems was the name of the company. ABI sequencers is what they were known as. <clears throat> okay, so huge, huge amount of, a huge increase in throughput given these technological advances. And one thing I hope to reemphasize over and over again in this course is that technological advances really drive that the, the creativity and the interesting questions that we can ask in genomics because there's a lot of, a lot of questions that we would love to be able to ask, but we just don't yet have the technology to go after them. So technology drives that. So even with these advances over 22 years, uh, it still would have taken 205 years to sequence the human genome with that technology. And that's why basically a bunch of these sequencers were bought. Um, the sequencing effort was distributed throughout labs all over the world. Okay, so. Um, the next wave of sequencing technologies really kicked off in 2005 with this technology called 454 um, sequencing. It was originally founded by a, a guy named Jonathan Rothberg. He then went on to go uh, create another sequencing technology called Ion Torrent, which we won't talk about today. I'm going to talk about the ones that are in green. 454 was bought by Roche, um, as Roche likes to do. Um, so. These sequencing technologies, which continue uh, to come out even today, have all sorts of different terms. Uh, they get really boring in the literature hearing about this, like massively high throughput, massively parallel, ultra high throughput, next generation, um, second generation. Um, I think of it as just modern DNA sequencing because there's just so many different technologies. Um, so we're going to highlight a few of the most widely used. One may not be so used anymore, given some recent events, but we're going to cover it anyway. So the breakthrough that occurred in my second year of grad school was this, I, I thought, amazing at the time. Uh, I still think it's pretty amazing and very clever. 454 sequencing. So the idea was 
you would shear DNA and you would add adapters that allow you to um, uh, basically tether these DNA fragments um, to beads that are then um, tracked into individual wells. Okay, so imagine each well on a solid surface contains one bead and that bead has many copies of one original template of DNA. And, the, um, and, and that's done through amplification on the bead with, a, with a proprietary process that they had. Okay, so now you've got a lot of copies of this molecule on a bead and that those clones of the same uh, DNA fragment could be used in principle to figure out what the sequence was. So here's where the, the second clever bit of the technology comes in. So they basically borrowed this enzyme from fireflies. Unfortunately, we don't see fly, fireflies very often in, in Utah, but where I grew up every night, we walk out in the backyard, thousands of fireflies. And as you probably know, they're, their butts light up. Um, and that's this, uh, this enzyme called luciferase. So Rothberg and crew realized that they knew that luciferase was excited through ATP. So they basically thought, well, every time a nucleotide is incorporated, this enzyme called sulfurylase would basically cut out the ATP. That ATP would be present in the well and excite luciferase. So essentially, whenever nucleotide, nucleotide was incorporated on those clonal fragments on the bead in the well, they basically excite light, and they could read that light and know what nucleotide was incorporated. So they went about doing this by basically in, in multiple cycles, they would drop in a bunch of A uh, nucleotides, and they would see which wells lit up, and they would know that those wells incorporated A. They would wash the reaction, they'd add Cs, and they'd see what wells lit up. Wash G, wash T, wash A, wash C, wash T, wash G, over and over and over again. And over time, essentially, they would get these like picture book movies, because they had, they had a picture for each uh, incorporation step, and they could stitch together. As long as they could track the light incorporated at each of those wells over time, they could stitch together what the sequence was. Super clever, right? The trick was that when they were incorporating nucleotides, they didn't use dideoxynucleotides. So let's imagine the template strand has one T. The nucleotide that needs to be incorporated is an A, one A, right? But so one A would be incorporated. If the template had five T's in a row, in principle, five A's would be incorporated. So the challenge was tracking how much intensity, how much light was emitted, and correlating that to the number of nucleotides that were actually incorporated. And you can imagine that that gets a bit saturated. So they were really good at distinguishing whether one A or one T, uh, two A's or three A's were incorporated. But once it got above like five or six, the signal sort of washed out and they couldn't figure out, oh, was it four or five or six nucleotides? So that was pro a problematic for these mononucleotide or also known as homopolymer runs. The human genome has lots of these, um, you know, 10 A's in a row. So the, the common error with this technology was undercalling the number of nucleotides that were incorporated in these long mononucleotide runs. Um, and this is what the traces look like on the x axis, which is the nucleotides that were incorporated, and the y axis was the light that was emitted. So you can imagine, you know, here, here's the light that's proportional to one nucleotide being incorporated. Here's two, here's three ish, here's four, and then you basically just read off from left to right. You know, there was one T followed by a C. Followed by an A, followed by a G, followed by a T, G, C, and then all of a sudden two A's. Okay? So this, the beauty of this was that you could sequence many, many template molecules in parallel on this, on this plate. Basically, if you could if you fragment lots of DNA, get templates on those beads, isolate those beads in many different wells, you could sequence like <coughs> millions of fragments in one reaction. Okay, um, so this was the, really the first post-Sanger sequencing technology to come out. Um, it was used, and it still is used, in diagnostic labs, and it's actually still pr fairly widely used to study bacterial genomes. Um, you can sequence a bacterial genome in one 
in one run using uh, this technology, if not if not less than one run. Um, it, it was, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, it was soon supplanted by Illumina. Um, but I had the great fortune when I was a grad student, my PI sent me to the sequencing course at Cold Spring Harbor, and that it was the first year that they used this technology. And the, the flow cells were 10,000 bucks a run. And 454 donated, they were right up the road, um, right across the Long Island Bay, Harbor or Bay, whatever it is, um, from Cold Spring Harbor, and they donated a machine and a bunch of flow cells. And each student got to create a library and load a flow cell. I was the only computational student in the class and had literally never picked up a pipette before. And I told them this, but they told me to go for it anyway. So created my library, put the tip on the pipette, put it into um, the, the hole that I was supposed to pipette it into. And for some reason, I didn't know that you had to release this, this valve. And so I just like jammed this, jammed it down, and literally the whole sequencing reaction like shot out of, of the, the sequencer and the whole $10,000 library was ruined. Um, so few, few people that were instructors in that course I still know today, and pretty much every time I see them, they bring that, that story up. So fairly, <laughs> fairly embarrassing. Okay, so fast forward the next year. So everyone got super excited about 454 sequencing, and then the next year everyone's like, oh my God, are you kidding me? There's this whole other technology, which I think is as clever, if not more clever than the 454 technology. So the basic idea, before we get into the step-by-step, -step, is Sanger, Sanger sequence, I'm sorry, Illumina sequencing, which was originally known as Selexa. Um, Selexa sequencing in part was developed by a really bright guy named Clive Brown. Um, Clive Brown now also was the inventor of Oxford nanopore sequencing. Um, well, the, the technology. Um, technique where you add these dideoxynucleotides to stop the reaction. But the beauty was they could reverse that. They could stop the reaction so that they could, would just incorporate one nucleotide at a time on an gr ever-growing template. And then once they stopped that reaction, they could wash it and then undo the stopping of the reaction. How they actually, I don't know the, the I think it's still proprietary, what the reversible terminator is, how they do this. But they could basically reverse that dideoxy and then add in the next nucleotide in the next, next round. Wash, add in the next nucleotide. And these nucleotides, just like Lee Hood's trick, were fluorescently labeled, okay? So um, the throughput of this technology was much greater than 454 because instead of a uh, solid state surface, surface with individual wells, they're basically doing this on a glass slide that was, um, I like to think of as like AstroTurf. There's a bunch of just sort of randomly placed um, tethers that are bound to the slide. That would be the analogy to the grass on, on AstroTurf. And then you can hybridize the molecules that you actually want to sequence onto those tethers. Um, it's fluorescently labeled nucleotides that are being incorporated. So they need to be able to track the fluorescence that's emitted when nucleotides are incorporated. But when this came out, it's essentially this, this slide with all these molecules floating on it, fluorescently labeled nucleotides are being incorporated. And then sitting on top of it is like a really sweet digital camera. And this was back in 2006. And if you had digital cameras back in 2006, they weren't that sweet. Um, so one of the, the problems was the ability of that camera to actually be able to, to detect um, nucleotide incorporation through fluorescence in a very sensitive way. And some of the early algorithmic advances for the technology were they basically recruited people from astronomy. They, it basically, it was a stargazing problem. They're looking at very faint light signal and trying to figure out, track when light was emitted, fluorescence, and make sure that they could register the incorporation of, of um, fluorescent or fluorescently labeled nucleotides on essentially a random field, a random star field. But the stars here are these, these tethered molecules. Okay, to make that problem easier, they basically did something called bridge PCR. So they'd start with one of these tethered molecules and they had a proprietary process where they could locally amplify each clone um, into like a bigger blade of grass on, 
temperature. And because those are clonal copies of the same molecule, they in principle should all be incorporating the same fluorescently labeled nucleotide in each step, and that amplifies the light that's emitted and makes it easier for these, um, at the time, somewhat sucky digital cameras that were detecting all the light. Now, 13 years later, you know, we have like nine cameras in, a, in an iPhone, and you can take better pictures with, than with the, the SLR that I got 10 years ago. So this problem has gotten easier, and that allows them to actually sequence more, ever more molecules on the same size slide because they can pack in individual copies, individual uh, templates, rather than you know, using up all the real estate on the slide by clonal, clonally amplifying the same um, molecule. So you have to do less bri bri bridge pre-CR uh, for each sequencing reaction. Um, so, I mean, really, I, I walked through this already, but essentially you're, you fragment your DNA. Back in the day, it was um, when I was in a, doing my postdoc working with this technology, we would actually take bulk DNA and pass it through a device, I think it was called Covaris, Covaris device. Um, there were two. One was shattering the DNA with sonication, I forget which one it was, and the other one was basically a ruby with a really tiny hole drilled in it, and you basically pass the molecules through that ruby, and the aperture of that hole in the ruby would make a fairly uniform fragment size. I think that was Covaris, maybe. So you fragment your DNA, because you want this, this technology requires that the, the molecules are roughly uniform in size so that that bridge, amp, uh, bridge PCR on the, on the solid surface works the same way pretty much for every molecule. Um, you add adapters, and then you basically load the flow cell by adding these molecules onto the flow cell, and these adapters allow it to tether to these blades of grass that are sort of the, they hybridize to on the, on the, um, on the flow cell. They get amplified and then you denature and amplify again, and then that's how you get this sort of clonal expansion of e each molecule. So it goes from you know, individual molecules after a few cycles into these big clusters, these big clusters, you emit more fluorescence than the individual molecule, and that allows you to, to track what's going on. But very much like the um, very much like the 454 sequencing, you're basically tracking individual clon uh, clonally amplified molecules in multiple images. So camera takes an image when um, A's are incorporated, tracks all of the uh, molecules on the flow cell that light up, washes, adds T's, tracks all the molecules that light up with a T, wash, C, wash, G, over and over again, and then you, you, you again end up with a flip bar. Of movies. So the algorithmic challenge is tracking the fluorescence, finding individual clo um, clonal uh, sequences, and tracking what lights up over time at those um, individual sites. So you can imagine it would be really bad if this technology, if the machine was like in a room that vibrated a lot, like if a train went by while the sequencing reaction was going on, you kind of lose registration, right? It's like a telescope moving if you've ever done that. It's zoomed in so much that even a subtle movement can throw off the registration. Um, so these things were big, they had a big solid base, and you, the idea was you would tend to try to put them in the basement of a really big building. Um, so probably everyone here has heard of Illumina sequencing, Illumina bot Alexa. Every year they release some new fancy thing. They're called NextSeq or NextSeq2 or NovaSeqs or whatever. I don't even know what the latest and greatest one is. I lost track. I used to track this stuff all the time, but don't at all. Um, my understanding is we can sequence one human genome in, in under 24 hours now, and it might even be more than one human genome. I've, the throughput is just so absurd now. Um, you're getting like 3 billion, no, I'm sorry, Six billion as of three years ago, so it must be like 10 or 12 billion individual sequences per run. So on those flow cells, there's like 12 billion molecules, okay? Um, the one thing I want to emphasize is that this reaction, I mean, this is an incredibly powerful technology, but it's not perfect. You know, this, this camera and, the, and the, all of the compute on these machines has to track 
fluorescence over time to figure out what the actual nucleotide sequence is for all those six or 12 billion individual DNA molecules that are tethered to the slides are. But because those molecules are close together, sometimes you can have bleed, bleed over so that the fluorescence from this clonally amplified set and the, the um, clonally amplified set next door to it, the fluorescence starts to bleed over. And that can lead to problems in figuring out what the exact nucleotide sequence is for a given fragment. And that's where sequencing errors come in. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about in a little bit is, you know, ideally we'd have a sequencing technology that just never makes mistakes. A lot of our computational challenges and analytical challenges really in any biological experiment using sequencing technology would be a lot easier where there are no mistakes, but there's mistakes. So a lot of what we have to do is that becomes noise in our experimental system. We have to figure out ways then to detect biological signal in the face of that noise. And that's a lot of what we'll be talking about. Um, this is the one that came out right when I moved um, my lab here to Utah. It was called the X10. It was a super clever marketing trick. They were like, hey, you can sequence a human genome in under a day for a thousand bucks if you buy 10 of these instruments. Um, and so only a few places had the money to buy 10 instruments. I think they were like, I think the investment was 10 million, a million dollars an instrument. And the idea was that you could get that kind of throughput amortized if you could sequence lots of genomes. So like the Broad Institute and New York Genome Center and Wellcome Trust all had the demand to sequence that kind of, that kind of number of genomes and, and could make it worthwhile. Um, we don't have that sort of need here at, at Utah. Um, you know, what's sad about this is then, you know, fast forward a couple years later and they have like one instrument that anyone could buy that has this kind of throughput. So it's, it's always a risk investing in these kind of rapidly evolving technologies. Okay. Um, one of the other important advances with the Illumina technology is this notion of paired end sequencing. So everything I talked about before is essentially imagine just taking one short molecule and sequencing the nucleotides in that short molecule. Well, because the human genome and most vertebrate genomes are really repetitive, a challenge was that those short sequences that you would get off of these machines were often much smaller than the typical repeat size in a, say, human genome. So it's like, it's like the puzzle, uh, jigsaw puzzle problem again. If you've got this really repetitive jigsaw puzzle, like you know the horrible one where it's a, they dump out a bunch of gumballs on a floor and you take a picture of it, there's lots of pink gumballs. You get a little tall and tiny puzzle piece that's smaller than the gumball size, you have a tough time figuring out which gumball it belongs to. But if it's bigger than a typical gumball size, you get information from the adjacent gumballs and they can figure out where it goes in on the puzzle piece. Same analogy here. If the DNA sequence is larger than the typical repeat size, you get flanking information. And that helps you place where that molecule goes in the, in the human genome or mouse genome or whatever. Um, so the trick was, well, shoot, we can't sequence like 1,000 base pair molecules. But what we can do is we can sequence 150 base pairs. We can do 150 base pairs of sequencing. And I'll talk about why it's limited to that in a second. So let's do this. Let's, let's trick the system. Let's take a, th a 500 base pair molecule and just sequence 75 base pairs on one end, 75 base pairs on the other end, and that those two pieces of information, if we know, if we can trust that they're uh, 150 total, 350 base pairs apart uniformly, because we fragmented the DNA in a uniform way, then that gives us two pieces of information with which to place that molecule in the genome. So it's sort of like you know, the gumball analogy, taking like one corner gumball size and another corner gumball size, and those two pieces of information help exclude or rule out other parts of the jigsaw puzzle. So um, big advance was that you could basically put in larger fragments of DNA and get snippets of information on, from the three five prime ends of both sides of that molecule. And those two pieces of information together are much more powerful than one tiny fragment on one end or the other. So why is this technology limited to 150 base pairs? It gets into that bleed through of fluorescence from uh, uh, adjacent clonally amplified templates. So as you incorporate more and more fluorescently labeled nucleotides, 
Um, each step you have to wash off all the fluorescence. That's not perfect. Sometimes there's residual fluorescence. And as you do more and more cycles, there's more and more residual fluorescence. And there's more and more crosstalk between adjacent molecules. And so beyond 150 base pairs, it gets really difficult to actually accurately predict what the sequence is because there's just so much like bleed, um, bleed through in the fluorescence, I guess, for lack of a better word. And they've really not been able to overcome that to this day. I, I don't know. I think you can, you can sequence maybe 250, 300 base pairs, but it's not like order of magnitude jumps. And so the state of the art still today is to use paired-end sequencing. Um, we no longer isolate fragments with, uh, uh, fragment the DNA with sonication or um, putting it through a tiny hole in a gemstone. We actually use um, transposases that actually bind to the DNA and put in the adapters in a roughly uniform size. So that requires less amplification because there's less attrition of DNA from sonicate than from sonication or from passing the DNA through a uh, tiny hole. Okay, so this is kind of a pictorial view of what um, paradigm sequencing empowers. Um, you know, we get a paradigm, this is what we would get off the sequencer up top. We get a snippet of DNA on the five prime end from one strand. And then we have this interstitial region of un unknown DNA sequence. We know there's DNA there because we put a 500 base pair fragment roughly on the, on the sequencer. We don't know what it is, but then we have at the other end another five prime snippet. So essentially we use alignment programs, which we'll talk about in a little while, to figure out where these two ends belong in the reference genome. You know, we've got this whole, all these chromosomes to deal with. And the idea is that if we can come up with a set of candidate loci in the genome for this end, that there might be a thousand possible places that this sequence can go because it's pretty short with respect to how repetitive the human genome is. So let's say we have a list of a thousand possible locations for this end, and then we get a list of a thousand possible locations on this end. Only a very small subset, usually one or two, of those locations that are possible for end one and end two are within 500 base pairs of one another. And since we know we're aligning, we've got five prime to three prime sequence on both ends, they should align to the reference genome. The, the leftmost, the lowest coordinate fragments should align on the positive strand with the, the reference genome strand, and the other end that's downstream should align on the opposite strand because the reference genome is only one strand. Okay, so we can use, it's, it's, kind, it's kind of like Sudoku. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Sudoku. Um, where you've got a list of things, you've got a list of things, you can rule things out based upon whether or not they're the expected distance apart, and then you have one other logical exclusion. You can eliminate situations where um, the two molecules align on the same strand, or the two ends align on the same strand. There's exceptions to that that I'll talk about later, but that's the basic idea. Okay, that's it for Illumina. Um, we're gonna talk more about Illumina sequencing later because that's actually a lot of the data that we're gonna end up using. Um, so another advance came out, oh gosh, I think this was maybe 2009 or 10. Um, this really fancy technology called um, Pacific Biosciences. And I just realized last night that they're, that they're um, Marketing material has a spelling mistake on it, which is pretty awesome. Um, this was the first true single molecule sequencing technology that was widely used. There was another one developed in Boston called Helicose. I'm going to skip it because it died really quickly. It was a really clever technology. But this was the first widely used uh, single molecule sequencing technology. And the way it works is, again, I think just super slick. You've got these little tiny pits in a well, and at the bottom of each of these wells is a single polymerase enzyme. And you add long DNA molecules of any length to this plate that has lots of these wells with a single polymerase molecule in it. You add in a boatload of fluorescently labeled nucleotides, and you let polymerase do its thing. 
it, it's given a template strand, it starts incorporating these fluorescently loop, uh, labeled nucleotides in real time. No, no chain termination, just let polymerase do its thing. And then on top, on top of this is again a fancy camera that is recording the fluorescence that's incorporated in each of these pits by each of these individual polymerase molecules, which are each um, incorporating nucleotides, fluorescently labeled nucleotides for individual DNA molecules. And so what you get, um, imagine this is a movie, and they call them movies, um, for an individual well. So over time, this is light intensity. Over time, polymerase hasn't incorporated anything, nothing, 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 and boom. It just incorporated in a nucleotide, and that's done, boom, nothing, 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 boom, incorporated. So there was a question earlier about, does it always look that nice? No. The challenge with this technology is that polymerase doesn't incorporate nucleotides in this sort of consistent, uniform way where you can be like, okay, yeah, we expect an incorporation like every, you know, one thousandth of a second. Sometimes it's just like, because it's a, it's a, a function of what the nucleotide is and the availability of fluorescently labeled nucleotides nearby in ATP, right? So sometimes it'll just be like, and incorporate 10 nucleotides. And so this movie is going to be like, lit, 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 lit. so the, the hard part is um, some of you may be taking the signal processing course of like, yeah, this is a signal processing problem. I'm trying to figure out, you've got this intensity over time. How do you break up that signal into discrete events? And that's how base calling is done with Pacific Biosciences. Um, super cool technology. Um, it was sort of the first technology that really challenged Illumina. The throughput wasn't nearly as high, but you could sequence really long molecules. Like, in fact, uh, I think today the meat, you can, if you have high molecular weight DNA that's not fragmented, you can get um, like uni easily 50,000 base pair um, sequencing reads. And so that's like if you're you know, doing a puzzle when you're a kid where you get like 10 big pieces. It's like, take, you know, once you do it a few times, it takes a few seconds because there's so much information in each piece that you can stitch it together really quickly. Right, so here's what that distribution looks like. This slide is old. It's way better than this even now. I should probably update this slide, but, you know, you can see that the mean fragment length, the uh, sequence length here is something like, I don't know, 9 or 10 kilobits. You can see it right up there. Um, and then, in some cases, they got a couple reads that are like, the biggest was 71,000 base pairs. Okay. Um, Illumina ended up trying to acquire Pacific Biosciences over the last two years. You probably read in the news if you follow this stuff. That uh, deal fell through. Basically, the UK said that's like violates antitrust stuff. The US followed suit and said no. Uh, so, right now, it looks like PacBio, I don't know, may or may not survive. Hopefully, they do because it's a great technology. Um, it was used uh, to sequence and assemble a bacterial genome and for about 500 bucks in less than a day. Right now, it's not quite $10,000 anymore. I think Evan Eichler's lab claims they can do a human genome in something like five or $6,000. That's still it's a lot of money to do anything really at scale in any uh, super interesting study. Okay, this is the last technology I'm going to talk about, but I think it's one to really pay attention to. It's a technology that my lab uses quite a bit, and it just keeps getting better and better, and the applications are almost endless at this point. It's called nanopore sequencing. Um, this is a picture of David Deemer's notebook, um, who dreamt up this technology. Um, I don't remember, I think there's a story about him driving along the Pacific Coast Highway and having this epiphany. I might be conflating Carrie Mullen stories, I don't know. Um, but the idea was pretty much drawn up in this, um, conceptualized in these two pictures. Um, and I can't read his handwriting, but apparently it sort of describes exactly what it's done today. So the idea would be that imagine you could have a pore, just a hole, on a plate or you can have thousands of pores on a plate. And that plate has current running through it. 
You then take DNA on one side of the plate, and the DNA passes through the pores. And as the DNA passes through the pores, it perturbs the current at the pore in a way that's indicative of the exact nucleotides that were occupying the pore over time, at a given point in time. So then what you end up with is if you have uh, current on the x, y axis and time on the x axis for a given pore, you know, the concept he came up with is, oh, well then, you know, if C was incorporated at this moment in time, the current is a steady state, looks like maybe here, gets knocked to, to that point, and then it goes back up again, and as soon as G comes in, it drops in an in indicative way. Um, and what you can kind of tell is that some of these nucleotides, the, the changing current looks kind of similar to one, the, one another. So again, it's a signal processing. And a lot of what the advances with Nanopore over the last two years have been is basically better algorithms for figuring out what sequence of nucleotides occupy the given pore given the data, which is really just this current uh, over time. Yeah. Did they ever get problems with what DNA blocks the changing nucleus? Uh, yeah, they did a lot and still do. Um, so a lot of their proprietary work, R&D, is basically figuring out what are the enzymes that um, occupy the pore at a given time. Um, this has the same, can suffer from the same issue that um, PacBio did, which is essentially that those molecules translocate through a pore, not at a steady state, but they can be bursty. And so they, they basically have engineered enzymes to do the best they can to control the processivity of the molecule through the, through the pore. Um, so this sequence is DNA. The sweet thing about this is that you're not incorporating anything. It's just taking the endogenous molecule um, through the pore. So in principle, you could be able to detect modified DNA bases too. So a, a methylated cytosine, this is what an unmethylated cytosine looks like. Maybe a methylated cytosine drops a signal even more. And so that's, that's being done. Um, uh, a guy named, um, I forgot his name, Jared Simpson in Toronto has developed a bunch of technologies for trying to figure out where methylation is, and I think Ryan is still tr is trying to use that for his research. Um, so this was the concept. People worked on this for like, what, well, what is it, three decades later? Um, about five or six years ago, this technology came to fruition in the form of this company called Oxford Nanopore. So I'm going to crank up the volume here. Uh, I'm going to try to. Hopefully you can, this will work. So Oxford Nanopore Technologies is a company that sells a sequencing device that basically is the realization of um, David Deemer's notebook. Shoot, didn't work. Let's see. Oh, the video is private. Let's fix that. Hold on a second. I don't type well, so sorry. Yeah, maybe this will work. Let's try this one. So Lit Mobile just sent me this solar wireless battery pack. I'm excited, let's see what's inside. I really Oxford Nanopore is developing nanopore sensing technologies for the analysis of biological molecules. At the heart of the technology is a protein nanopore. This model shows a typical nanopore made from protein. You can see at the core of the protein there is a hollow tube that is only a few nanometers in diameter. Oxford Nanopore designs and manufactures bespoke nanopore structures for a range of applications. In nature, nanopores form holes in membranes. In Oxford Nanopore's technology, the nanopore is inserted into a membrane created by a synthetic polymer. This membrane has very high electrical resistance. By applying a potential across the membrane, a current can be generated through the nanopore. Single molecules that enter the nanopore cause characteristic disruptions in the current. By measuring that current, the molecule can be identified. Larger target molecules may pass near the opening of the nanopore rather than passing through it. This might, for example, be a protein molecule. The nanopore and membrane are bathed in electrochemical solution and the ionic current is measured through the open nanopore. 
In order to create a high throughput system, a number of nanopore experiments can be conducted at the same time by using an array chip. A single nanopore is inserted into a polymer membrane across the top of a microwell. Each microwell has its own electrode for individual sensing. Multiple microwells are fabricated into an array chip using standard semiconductor materials. Microwells are connected to channels of an application-specific integrated circuit and these individually addressable channels measure the nanopore signal. These array chips may be scaled according to need. The user may require tens of channels to hundreds of thousands of channels depending on the application. This array chip is built into a consumable cartridge called a flow cell. The analyte is added to the flow cell which is then used in conjunction with a min-iron or promethion instrument for real-time data collection and analysis. Okay, so pretty cool. Um, the device, this is one that's in my lab. Um, it's called a min-ion. Um, and basically you flip this lid up, put the flow cell that she just talked about in there, pipette your DNA that has a, uh, adapters on it, and those adapters allow chaperone molecules to bring the DNA molecule to the pore, and then the sequencing works in the way we just talked about. And so what, the reason this is connected via um, a fancy USB cable to this laptop is that data is being passed through the USB cable um, to the laptop in real time so that you can essentially do base calling um, from that signal, the perturbation in that current signal for each nanopore in real time. Um, that's a little harder than, it, than I described it. We have to do this in our lab. We have a special computer now that has a fancy GPU that is typically used for gaming graphics, but it does um, really fast base calling now. Um, I think it's just, to me, it's, it's kind of insane that this works. Um, when we first started using it four years ago, it, it didn't work very well, admittedly. I'm glad we persevered. It works incredibly well now, um, and um, the throughput gets better and better. The accuracy of the technology gets better and better. I sell, sound like a salesman, but it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so uh, you load libraries here, you get an array of these 2048 uh, molecules. Um, back in 2015, you could get like four to six KB molecules because like PacBio in principle, there's no limit to the size of the molecule that you could translate locate through a pore. Fast forward, um, and the, but the, the error rate was somewhat high, like the only about one out of every 10 nucleotides that it called, that it predicted were wrong. So that's difficult for finding single nucleotide polymorphisms because you know, a lot of the predicted differences between the reference genome will actually just be sequencing errors. This is 2015 data from a, a paper I, I wrote with a colleague. Um, but fast forward to today, the, the, the accuracy is much better and the read length um, is much better. Like you can easily get 50 KB molecules. People have um, generated sequences that are more than a megabase long. Um, okay, so and it, you know here's here's an example run where yeah we've got you know, a mean of something like six or seven kilobase sequences. It's super portable. That's one of the advantages. Um, Kate Rubens took uh, a, a nanopore, a min ion, up to the International Space Station and did something with it. I don't really remember what they sequenced, um, but they proved that it worked. Not surprising that it did. Um, and then. Um, few labs. Uh, well, this really kicked off with a collaboration between uh, Pybus and Nick Lohman. Um, basically taking these devices uh, into the wild, essentially, and tracking um, uh, viral uh, isolates from in individuals that were affected, in this case, with Zika. Um, this is actually, I just read the news this morning. These things are being deployed right now to Wuhan to study the coronavirus, the outbreak that's going on in Wuhan right now. Um, so, you know, the portability is, is really quite nice. Um, and I, I didn't mention this, it can now directly sequence RNA. And I think the coronavirus is an RNA virus. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that's one of the advantages of it. Okay, so it works. Um, so here's a comparison of DNA sequencing data from the Illumina technology and the Oxford Nanopore technology. At one particular locus on uh, chromosome 1, on this band, uh, P34.3, 
and there just happens to be a 1,400, uh, I'm sorry, a 500 base pair um, deletion in this individual that you, can, uh, that you can see easily with the nanopore sequencing. So there's this cutoff and coverage. There's some alignments that sort of bleed into the deleted area. We'll talk about that later. But you can see that the Illumina data and the nanopore data both um, recapitulate the same deletion. But what you can also see is that there's all these little purple lines and black dashes throughout these alignments for nanopore. Those are sequencing errors. Those are situations, and it's, it's kind of the same problem as with um, 454 or PacBio. The molecule is passing through that pore not at a consistent rate. Sometimes it bursts through, and that can lead to undercalling the exact nucleotide sequences there, maybe missing a base. And if it's missing a base, then you end up with a deletion or a gap with respect to the reference genome because there truly was a base there. Okay? All right. Now we're going to get into the, the main focus of today, which is learning um, about FASTQ format, the actual sequence that we get out of any of these technologies. All of these technologies that we talked about now produce the same format. When they sequence DNA, however they do it, they give you a file, a text file. We're, we're comfortable with text files now. That is similar in spirit to the FASTA format. Essentially, there's a bunch of lines in that file. Each line represents, each group of lines represents an individual sequence that came off the machine. And there's some information in there that we'll, we'll talk about. And each of the, what we end up doing in our experiments, step one is almost always taking that FASTQ file, which has all these potentially billions of individual sequences, so billions of lines in a file, and figuring out where those sequences belong in the reference genome. That's typically step one to do anything whether it's RNA sequencing, DNA sequencing, CHIP-seq, ATAC-seq, um, what's another seq that's hot now? I don't know, single-cell RNA-seq. Anyone do anything else that I haven't mentioned? No? Okay, well, that covers it. They all start with a FASTQ file aligning to a reference genome, and that gives you the raw signal that you're using to, to study the biological question you're after. So here's an example. In this case, um, we're looking at, a, at the raw signal from the 454 sequencing technology, which we walked through before. But, you know, it's not a, a human that looked at these one by one. You know, if there's millions of, of traces like this for each of the uh, beads that are in the 454 signal, we, it's not a human that's doing this. We need algorithms. We need software that <coughs> convert this raw signal into something like that. Okay? Um, and let's imagine that most of the time that conversion, that interpretation of that signal reflects the truth, the true sequence, which is these black nucleotides. Every once in a while, it makes a mistake, right? Such as this G nucleotide. Um, and the frequency with which these errors arise is really governs how useful the technology is to study different biological questions. For instance, if you're studying, if you want to use a sequencing technology to sequence a tumor genome and you're looking for all of the mutations that are in the heterogeneous cell population that comprises the, the tumor, there are going to be mutations in that tumor that are very rare, like one, less than 1% 1 of cells have them or less than ten, uh, one tenth of a percent of cells have them. Well, if the error rate of the technology that you're using to study or find those mutations is similar to the rate at which those mutations occur or exist in the um, in the cell population, you're kind of hosed, right? I mean, if if it's let's say your error rate is one percent and you're looking for one percent frequency mutations, by definition, fifty percent of the things that you think are mutations are errors because the rate is the same. It's a it's a coin flip every time, right? Okay, so um, I think now we can say all. This mostly can go away. They produce a format that, is, that looks like this. Part of this is probably intuitive. The other part is uh, crazy. So let's imagine on the Illumina sequencer, we've got all those different molecules that are being tracked by the fancy digital camera. And we've got those movies with the fluorescence of the same... Um, 
clonally amplified fragment over time. In those movies, an algorithm basically is trying to figure out, all right, well, it moved that slide one in the movie, and A was incorporated at that position. Slide two, it was a C, et cetera, et cetera. So the sequence for one fragment on that uh, flow cell might look like this. That's sequence one. Each sequence in a FASTQ file, what we're looking at is a snippet of a FASTQ file, is comprised of four lines. Something that identifies the sequence, like a, a unique cluster on the flow cell, the predicted nucleotide sequence for that cluster, a plus sign, that plus sign is always there for reasons that are um, insane to me, just kind of not needed, um, and then looks like you know swearing in a cartoon, a whole bunch of uh, characters, right? And those characters, if you notice, there's one character per nucleotide. The characters reflect the confidence that the base calling or the algorithms that were used to convert signal into sequence, these characters represent how confident, for instance, this T is actually a T, or this G is actually a G. Um, I don't know anyone that can look at those characters and tell you what the probability estimates are associated with each of those um, nucleotides, but this parenthesis is saying, I think there's a one in a hundred chance, for instance, that this T is not a T. But for this G, this plus sign tells me, ah, maybe there's a one in 10 chance that that G is actually not a G. So fortunately, there's a, a, a system we can, that computers can use to translate these characters into probability estimates. And those probability estimates are used by sequence aligners and things that call mutations and tumor genomes to try and tease apart how much biological confident evidence do we have that this really is a difference with respect to the reference genome rather than just a sequencing error, okay? So concretely, if there are one billion DNA sequences on the flow cell from this run, we had a you know, killer sequencing run, there would be four billion lines in the FASTQ file. There's one million, or one billion, did I say four billion or four million? There should be four billion lines because it's one, one billion fragments. Um, there's, and because each sequence is comprised of these four different lines. Okay, so uh, again, we get a sequencing, sequence ID, the sequence, the separator, which separates the sequence and the quality scores. Um, and if you, if you want to read the gory details of all this, there's actually a wiki page uh, about the FASTQ format because it's such a confusing format. Um, so the sequencing ID, I, I, I sort of simplified the sequence ID. This is just, you know, it always starts with an at sign and then there's some descriptor of the actual fragment uh, of DNA that was, that coincides with this, that generated this sequence. But on a um, Illumina sequencer, let's focus on the new format because pr pretty much any data that you'd look at in the last five years in the future would look like this. It has some kind of useful information. It's really helpful for identifying batch effects or for problematic flow cells. So it'll tell you the name of the sequencer that actually generated it. So, you know, the ones up at ARUP and at Huntsman probably have their own IDs. I have no idea what they're called. Um, it, each sequencer keeps track of what run it is. is. In this case, this sequence came from the 136th run of this instrument. It tracks what flow cell. Every Illumina flow cell comes with an ID. So every sequence in this run will have this information. And that's important because a lot of times flow cells can be bad. There's a batch problem. So if you know that the sequence, this run looks terrible, you can look at the flow cell, write uh, some hate mail to Illumina and say, hey, this flow cell, it looks terrible. And they'll be like, oh yeah, that's a bad batch. We'll send you a new one kind of thing, hopefully. The flow cells are broken up into lanes. Um, that's basically um, because the camera basically moves all throughout the image, the flow cells are so big and they have to zoom in so much that the camera actually moves because they can't actually image everything at once. So it'll move down lanes and then within each lane there's uh, tiles. So this read came from the second lane on this glass slide and within that lane there's a bunch of different tiles. 
this this fragment of DNA was on tile number 2104. And this is this kind of gets at how the base calling actually works. There's an XY coordinate on that tile, on that second lane. That is, you know, that's the information that this stargazing algorithm using the camera is using to track the fluorescence of individual molecules. They each get XY coordinates on a tile, on a, on a flow cell, on a flow cell lane. Okay? And then um, we get information about whether the sequence came from the first end, if it's a paired end sequence, or the second end that was sequenced. So then in this case, this came from the first five prime end that was sequenced. Um, and then there's some other information that doesn't matter. And then if you're barcoding the DNA so that you can do multiple samples at once, this would be the barcode sequence, okay? So all in all, all this information is packed into a uh, sequence ID that looks like this. It's basically all this information is concatenated with a colon separating each of these pieces of information, okay? So instead of at seek ID, this sequence would actually have at EAS 139, et cetera, et cetera, okay? All right, so sequencing errors. We know that sequencing technologies make errors, and that's what these quality scores are meant to convey to you, is, is what's the likelihood that an error was made. Um, the quality score, um, let's, let's ignore the character for a moment and just talk about how the, the probability of an error is uh, calculated. So let's imagine that the sequencing technology, Illumina, can calculate for a given base, say this A, the probability that an error occurred, that it was actually a C, G, or G on three bases. And it would, you know, just intuitively, it would probably calculate that something about the fluorescence from the previous cycle and adjacent fluorescence and that type of stuff. But let's say it estimates the probability of error at 0.1. So there's a 10% chance that I got this wrong. The quality score is calculated like this. You take 0.1, you take the log, the base 10 log of that, which would be negative 1, if this probability is 0.1, and then you multiply that by negative 10. So negative 1 times negative 10 is 10. So if there's a 10% chance of error, the quality score is 10. 10% chance of error is bad, right? That's, that's not a terribly comparable measure. So let's imagine it's an order of magnitude more confident, and so the probability of error is 0 0.01. So 1 in 100 chance. So 0 0.01 log 10 of that is what? Two shifts of the decimal point, right? So negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 10 is 20. So each jump in 10 in the quality score reflects an order of magnitude increase in the confidence of that base. The, error, the probability of error is an order of magnitude lower, so the confidence in that base is an order of magnitude higher. So let's, let's, um, let's jump ahead to a really high quality score. So let's imagine the probability of error was uh, 1 in 10,000. So 1 in 10,000, the base 10 log of that is negative 4. Negative 4 times negative 10 is 40. So a rule of thumb in sequencing is a quality score of 30 or more, which is a probability of error of 1 in 1,000, is a, is a high quality nucleotide, high quality base call. If it's less than 30, a decent rule of thumb is maybe have some, some questions about that. Now this all depends upon the technology actually ac accurately calculating the if we assume that, that they've done that well, um, then these quality scores, um, which we still haven't talked about the character yet, but imagine there's numbers associated with these. These quality scores for each base can help sequence aligners and variant callers figure out what's real biological signal and what's sequencing error. Okay, so how do we get to these crazy numbers? Well, these quality scores of, say, 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 11 or 17 or whatever, each of those numbers have a, have a coinciding character. So each of these characters represent a, a two-digit, often two-digit number. So the reason characters are used is because for each of there's one character representing a nucleotide, it would, it, 
it would be kind of confusing to read if it was two digits for, say the quality score for this is 10, there would be two adjacent numbers, uh, one and zero for this G. The idea was, well, let's just use a single character so there's a one-to-one -one registration between nucleotide and character. Unfortunately, that's very difficult for humans to read, but it's trivial for computers to read, okay? So now let's, what we're gonna talk about is the connection between these quality scores and the characters that are assigned. Before I do that, does anyone have uh, uh, any questions about this quality score? This is known as the Fred scale. This is after Phil Green at the University of Washington um, Genome Sciences Department. Um, he wrote a bunch of programs whose first two letters were PH for Phil. One of them was called Fred. That was assigning quality scores to the Sanger traces back in the day. The same, the same calculation was used, and it's just been propagated to modern sequencing. Everyone clear on how that's calculated? Okay. Question. Yeah. So the probability of error just depends on like the technology. And yes. Yes. And actually, you know, one of the first, the first series of papers that usually comes out from when a new technology comes out is basically like benchmarking it and figuring out what the true error rate is and, and how well, I mean, ideally, every probability of error estimate probability of error estimate is exactly predictive of the rate at which an error is made for all nucleotides with that probability of error. So, for instance, if we, for all nucleotides that were assigned a probability of error of 0.01 for a FRED scale, uh, FRED score of 20, you'd want, on average, one out of 100 of those to be wrong. If it's much more than that, that's bad, right? Because you can't actually trust the, the probability of error estimate, therefore you can't trust the quality estimate, therefore you can't trust sequence alignment and variant calling using those probabilities. Okay, um, so this is kind of walking through it again. If the probability of error is one, um, the, the uh, log 10 of that is zero, so the Fred quality score will be zero, so that's a really bad nucleotide. Let's jump up an or down an order of magnitude and error probability, so that's negative one. We get a Fred scale quality score of 10, and so on and so forth. Okay, so each jump by 10 in Fred quality score, as I mentioned, reflects a, a decrease in 10 in the probability of error by a factor of 10. And as I said, um, uh, this is probably outdated. 20, 20 is considered good, 30 is considered great, um, and you can really trust it. But you can see this sort of log relationship between the probability of error and the quality score that's assigned to a base with that probability of error. Um, so we can actually skip this. I, I included this slide a few years ago because it was right in the transition of actually the encoding of these quality scores with characters was changing. The format was changing. So in older formats, you know, a 40 meant an, uh, a quality score of 40 was given a uh, character I. And in this new format, um, a quality score of 9 was given an I. So that's a huge difference, right? You don't have to worry about this anymore. Everyone's basically using the same encoding scheme. But what this shows you is this connection between a quality score range of, say, 0 all the way to 41 is basically just a lookup table on this, this thing that's called an ASCII table. When you, when you type the letter J on your key, uh, laptop and a, a current is sent to the CPU, the CPU is using this ASCII table to figure out what that uh, numeric encoding should be, how it should be displayed on the screen. So there's a connection between characters and these, these ASCII, uh, you've probably maybe heard of ASCII and Unicode. Um, these are basically different ways to represent, that, com that computers represent sort of things that are typed on a computer or printed on a screen in actual uh, characters. Okay, all we need to know is that these characters have a corresponding quality score associated with them. You should never, ever have to look at any file and try to figure out what the character is, what, what quality score it is based upon the character, because all the tools that we use actually are going to be doing that calculation for us behind the scenes. When you go to IGV and hover over a base, it'll say that the quality of that base is 30. It won't say that the quality of that base is exclamation point. It'll do that conversion for you. But the reason we're going through this is because it's just important to know what's going on. Um, so this is this, this geekery that is the ASCII table. So um, when, you, when you actually type a letter J, for instance, 
There's two representations of that. There's a decimal representation and a hexadecimal. If you've had any computer science, you might have learned about um, base 8, base 16, uh, base 2, all these things. Um, so there's different encodings, but ultimately a J would represent a quality score of um, 74 minus 33. Why the minus 33? The printable characters start at 33. So you notice all these uh, in the ASCII table, all these characters lower than 33 are things that we never see, like a space character. Um, so when I hit the space bar, it sends you the computer decimal 32 and hex 20, and that means um, it should display a, a space on your Word program. Uh, for another example, there's one that makes a bell sound, I think. Yeah, audible bell. Um, I don't know how to do that on my computer, but there's an encoding that makes it go bonk, you know, like if you're in terminal and you type the wrong thing, maybe yours bonks at you. It's, it's basically this lookup table. All right. Um, so there's, this is again building out quality scores, probability of error, the ASCII code, and the, res, um, uh, the resulting uh, character. So a really high quality base would be a quality score of 40, in the current encoding, bases with a quality score of 40 would have an I underneath them. 41 would have a J. 30 would have a exclamation or question mark, etc. Okay. Um, so, uh, in the last five minutes, I just want to cover a few tools of the trade here. One of the fundamental questions when you do a sequencing run, especially uh, if you're if you're new to it and trying to figure out the technology, is like, is this a good sequencing run or not? Is, is this like high quality data or is this crap? Um, so uh, there's a really nice tool out there called FastQC, which will take this FastQ format and hence the name do QC or quality control on it. And it'll give you histograms of, in this case, the quality score on the y-axis as a function of the position in the sequencing read. So in this case, the sequencing run that we did only had 40 nucleotides per read. So this is pretty old. It's maybe like five years old at this point. Um, and then you get these box whiskers plots for the, average, the distribution of quality scores across all the reads that were sequenced at position one on the read, five prime, the five prime n to the three prime n. And one, one trend you can see quite clearly is that the average quality score goes down as a function as, as we get deeper and deeper into the sequence. So as we do many more cycles of Illumina sequencing, you get that crosstalk and that bleed through of fluorescence and therefore the quality scores go down and down because the, Lumina, the base calling algorithm is recognizing, ooh, I can't be quite as sure about what's going on here because there's residual fluorescence, there's all this stuff going on. But the first few cycles, man, it's like, it's killer, right? I mean, most of this is, it's pretty confident that there's a, like a one in a thousand chance that I'm wrong given that the quality score is 30, okay? So you can... If, you, if you're doing this type of work, you can get a FastQC file and you can run it through this program. You can download the program here. Um, it's from the Babraham um, uh, Bioinformatics Group in the UK. Um, this this uh, program is relevant to your homework. Um, it's called SeqTK. It's a sequencing toolkit. It allows you to manipulate um, FastQ and FastA files. So like sorting them, finding reads that have a quality, quality, average quality score above a certain threshold, so your high confidence sequences, you can do lots of different things with it. It's written by a guy, guy named Hung Lee who wrote SAM tools and BWA and like basically all the great software that's in our field. Um, so I'm not gonna talk much more about that. There's great documentation. Go to this website, read it for the, um, for the homework. Um, and um, I will make sure that it's installed on Malibu. It's not installed yet. Um, that, that program precedes a program written by, by my friend uh, Asaf Gordon called FastX. Um, uh, SeqTK is, is now much better than FastX, so I'd recommend using it. Um, at the time that the slide was made, FastX was sort of equivalent, but let's just um, focus on SeqTK for now. Now, Lastly, there's this great program called BioAuk. Um, we probably we haven't talked about Auk yet in class, right? So Auk is a standard uh, tool um, that's installed on Unix systems. 
for slicing and dicing uh, text files whose columns are separated by tabs. Um, Hung Lee and I, who wrote BioAuk, I, I wrote a sort of crappy version of this idea to have uh, something like awk that works for um, sequencing formats like VCF files and FastQ and all this stuff and um, tweeted about it like six years ago and Hung sort of took the idea and, and <laughs> wrote something that's a thousand times better than what I did. But it's a really nice um, tool because you can say, all right, I'm going to give it a FastQ file as input and I want it to print, we don't have to worry about the syntax here, but it's saying print the name field for all, and then followed by a tab, followed by the sequence for all the entries in the task queue form. So the output would be sequence name, then sequence. And what's nice about this is that information is all on one line and it's tab separated. And hopefully you're starting to appreciate that Unix really likes data when all the information for a record for data entry is on the same line and it's tab separated because you can you can use grep for instance and it's all the information is on one line. Unix really works line by line. The bad thing is FastQ format has occupies four lines for each data entry, which again is sort of insanity given given um, that Unix is the de facto language or system for working with these files. Why the designers chose to put it across four lines, I have no idea. It would have been much better to just have it as four columns on one line. So BioAuk allows you to sort of transform or shred up that file to make it more amenable to Unix tools. Okay, so uh, in the last, well, I've gone over by 10 seconds. Sorry about that. Um, this is homework three. It is not due next week. It's due February 6th, so there's two weeks to do this one. Take it a little bit longer. I'm giving you that time because I think it gets a little bit harder for this one, and I have some work to do to get things set up properly on Malibu. I'm there's still some issues going on that I'm trying to deal with. Um, so thanks for your time, and we'll see you Tuesday.